tonight on News Center. North Korea Party Congress agrees to ramp up its nuclear weapons policy, among other things, during their rare Workers' Party Congress. Meanwhile, a BBC reporting crew is expelled for what the North deemed a disrespectful portrayal of the reclusive state and its leader, Kim Jong-un. President Park Geun-hye calls North Korea's declaration as a nuclear weapons state a grave threat to global peace and security, while China and Japan also issue statements in tune with the South Korean president's remarks. And Seoul's finance chief says that boosting state-run banks' capital is part of the government's contingency plan to prepare for any financial jitters that may occur during corporate restructuring. News Center begins right now. It's 9 in Washington, 2 in London, and 10 on a Monday evening here in Seoul. Hello and welcome to our viewers all across the globe. You're watching Arirang News Center. Now, we begin in North Korea, where the regime's Rare Workers' Party Congress closed its fourth day of the once-in-a-generation gathering. Four days and 100 foreign journalists in the North Korean capital, but uh, information regarding the convention has been quite limited, to say the least. But we are getting reports from multiple foreign news outlets that Kim Jong-un has been given a new title. It's something North Korean experts have been speculating for some time now. Live on the line with us is our Connie Kim from Seoul's Ministry of Unification, which of course is in charge of North Korean affairs. Now, Connie, do we have a confirmation from the South Korean government of these uh, foreign reports? Well, Konyang, about three hours ago, Japanese-based broadcaster NHK reported that Kim Jong-un was elected as the chairman of the ruling Workers' Party of Korea. North Korea has not made any announcements yet, but considering that NHK was one of the few allowed inside the convention adds credibility to this latest news report. Now, the title that the young North Korean leader would be given has been carefully watched as Kim Jong-un has been seeking to secure the legitimacy of the ruling Kim family dynasty through this highest political gathering. NHK also reported that the party has five standing members of the Workers' Party of Korea. They are Kim Jong-un, Kim Young-nam, Hwang Byung-seo, Choi Ryong-hae, and Park Bong-ju. In other words, two additional party members, Choi Ryong-hae and Park Bong-ju, have been added to the standing committee of the Workers' Party of Korea's political bureau. And to give you a little bit of background information, Party Secretary Choi Ryong-hae has recently made a solid comeback after vanishing from the public eye, and Park Bong-ju is the North Korean premier. Right, a glimpse into uh, the new power structure in the north, and I'd like to add that um, AP, AFP, and Kyoto are also now reporting of that same news as uh, NHK. But Connie, uh, give us a recap of uh, what's been announced from the Secret of State's very rare party congress so far. Right, Kanyang, the first two days have been used to brief the accomplishments of the ruling party. After, complete, after concluding brief, Pyongyang has adopted a decision on Sunday that aims to improve and expand its nuclear arsenal. It's stated that Pyongyang will pursue economic development and boost the state's self-defensive nuclear force both in quality and quantity, supporting the so-called Pyongyang policy spearheaded by leader Kim Jong-un. The statement also formalized North Korea's position of declaring itself a responsible nuclear weapon state, and reiterated that it would not use nuclear weapons unless its sovereignty is threatened by other nuclear-armed countries. And the general consensus now seems to be that the young Kim used this rare party convention to reaffirm the North Korea's position as a nuclear state, which will only further isolate it from the international community. Now, we are into the fourth day of the convention, and it was expected to focus on discussions of party rules and include mass parades, but we're not getting any confirmation on these either, so we'll have to keep an ear out for announcements by the North. I'll be sure to keep you updated. Back to you. Thank you, Connie. Our Connie Kim live from Seoul's ministry in charge of North Korean affairs. Now, President Park once again called for joint efforts from the international community in curbing North Korea's nuclear ambitions, calling the North's latest declaration as a nuclear weapons state a serious threat to global peace and security. China and Japan shared a similar stance against Pyongyang's nuclear ambitions. Our Song Ji-sun has this report. 
a challenge to global peace and security. That's how President Park Geun-hye assessed North Korea's declaration as a nuclear weapons state. Meeting with Kuwait's Prime Minister Jaber Al Mubarak Al Hamad Al Sabah on Monday, President Park said North Korea's fourth nuclear test, long-range missile launch, and now its latest claim pose serious threats beyond the peninsula and the region. Jaber pledged Kuwait's support in implementing sanctions on Pyongyang in response to Park's call to join international efforts in denuclearizing the North. Over in Beijing, China noted Pyongyang's action in wars of pushing forward its nuclear ambitions as anachronistic, reiterating its stance on non-proliferation. Realizing denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula, maintaining peace and stability, and resolving the peninsula's nuclear issue through negotiation and dialogue are in all sides' interests, and we hope all parties can make efforts in this regard to accord with the trend of the times. Japan also responded promptly. At a daily briefing, Chief Cabinet Secretary Yoshihide Suga said North Korea must urgently implement all UN Security Council resolutions. Tokyo and Washington also vowed on Monday to rub up their military alliance against North Korea's continued nuclear threats in a meeting between Japan's Defense Minister Ken Nakatani and U.S. Navy Secretary Ray Mabus. Song ji -sun, Arirang News. South Korean government has made crystal clear that neither Seoul nor the international community will ever recognize Pyongyang as a nuclear state. Our national defense correspondent Kim Hyun bin reports. South Korea's defense ministry refuses to accept North Korea as a nuclear state and says Seoul will take steps to block Pyongyang. Neither Seoul or the international community will recognize North Korea as a nuclear state, and we will continue to impose strong sanctions on Pyongyang to pressure it to give up its nuclear program. The defense ministry spokesman also characterized the regime's proposal for talks with Seoul as insincere. North Korea wants to conduct nuclear missile tests and at the same time wants to start a military dialogue. There is no sincerity in their offer. He said that Seoul is open to dialogue with the North, but only as long as the regime ends its provocations and takes concrete steps toward denuclearization. Meanwhile, South Korea and the United States are scheduled to discuss implementing an operational plan designed to counter North Korea's nuclear and missile threats. The so-called 4D plan, which stands for Disrupt, Detect, Destroy and Defend, gives South Korea the right to launch a preemptive strike against North Korea's nuclear and missile capabilities. The South Korean delegation will be led by Deputy Minister for National Defense Policy, Yu Jae-sung, and the U.S. delegation will be led by Assistant Secretary of Defense for East Asia, Abraham Denmark. The Allies will discuss the plan at the Korea-U.S. Integrated Defense Dialogue in Washington. The talks start Monday and run through Tuesday. Kim Hyun bin Arirang News. As we mentioned, there are some 100 foreign journalists in Pyongyang upon invitation from North Korea to cover its Workers' Party Congress. But rarely anything regarding the political gathering have we heard from those news outlets. Up until today, a small group got into that uh, conference hall, but, uh, but up until today, none of them even got within 200 meters from the main hall. Not only that, today we're learning that a BBC reporting crew was expelled for his reporting after being detained for hours. Our Kwon Soa has the details. A BBC reporter who was in Pyongyang before and during the 7th Workers' Party Congress has been expelled from North Korea along with his team. The CNN reporter who first reported the news said on his Twitter feed that BBC Tokyo correspondent Rupert Wingfield Hayes had been detained and then expelled by North Korea for reporting deemed, quote, disrespectful of leader Kim Jong-un, as North Korean authorities had said during a press conference. Although it's not exactly known which parts of the reports the North objects to, the stories highlighted aspects of life in Pyongyang, and one of them referred to North Korea's leader as corpulent. The correspondent, a producer and a cameraman, arrived in North Korea prior to the Congress, accompanying Nobel Prize laureates on a research trip. The BBC said the reporter was questioned for eight hours on the weekend and made to sign a statement before his release. 
It's not a big exaggeration to say that reporting on the Workers' Party Congress hasn't been any easier for the journalists who traveled all the way to Pyongyang for the once-in-a-generation event than it has been for us here in Seoul across the border. Journalists with the more than 100 international media outlets in the North Korean capital had to be content with watching the sessions on screens outside of the venue instead of being allowed inside, despite having been invited by the regime to attend. It's North Korea. I'm happy that we are here and able to even stand at the front. But at the same time, yeah, it's frustrating not to get any access or any information. We, we, what is happening there? So it's like, it's interesting because we have to write about that. But. Reporters found themselves touring locations such as an electric cable factory, a silk mill and the Pyongyang subway, places the North Korean regime apparently wanted them to cover even more than the proceedings of the rare Congress. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Well, it appears that North Korea's fresh declaration of its nuclear ambitions in defiance of U.N. sanctions are not resonating with its only ally, China. A South Korean news outlet reports, citing unnamed sources in China, that Beijing is tightening sanctions against Pyongyang, refusing to issue new working visas for North Koreans, and halting their financial transactions in the country. Our Kim Hye-sung has this report. Chinese authorities announced Monday that it will stop issuing new visas for North Koreans who plan to work for Chinese firms and North Korean restaurants operating near border cities, according to Korea's Yonhap News Agency. Such a move is expected to cut the inflow of foreign currency to the cash-strapped North. Chinese business owners operating North Korean restaurants say that visas will only be extended for North Koreans already working in the country, which is likely to cut at their business. There are around 20,000 North Koreans working in China. They usually work for three years, then return to North Korea. If new working visas are not issued, many Chinese firms may soon face labor shortage and an annual loss of $100 million. The Chinese government is also reportedly planning to stop North Korean workers from using credit and debit cards in China. This is all part of a larger effort to tighten up on the North in line with the tougher U.N. security sanctions following Pyongyang's fourth nuclear test earlier this year. In March, China, which usually vetoes tough sanctions against the North, agreed to ban exports of coal, iron and iron ore and rare earth minerals from North Korea for the first time. And now it's cracking down on North Korean labor. China is frustrated by Pyongyang's nuclear and missile tests, which only serve to increase U.S. involvement in Northeast Asia. By imposing tighter sanctions, China is pressuring the North to return to the negotiation table. Last month, 13 North Korean restaurant workers fled China and defected to the South as those businesses struggled to make profits. As sanctions against the regime tighten further, businesses operating along the North Korea-China border could suffer even more. Kim Hye-sung, Arirang News. A public campaign against oxy record Kaiser has gathered momentum here in Korea. Families of the victims and numerous civic groups in this country announced today that they'll kick off a week-long campaign to boycott Oxy products. Many local stores and convenience chains have already begun taking the company's products off their shelves. Lee min reports. Growing public outrage over the oxy humidifier disinfectant scandal is starting to take a heavy toll on the company. And sales of the oxy products are likely to dip down even further. While mass consumer strikes against oxy Reckitt Benkiser's products are rapidly expanding through social media, families of the victims and some 50 civic groups announced they will stage a week-long public boycott of Oxy products starting from Tuesday. During the period, they will be calling upon citizens as well as businesses to take part in the boycott, staging protests, distributing informative flyers and engaging in online activities. They will collectively work towards institutional improvement and litigation, as well as team up with international organizations. Convenience stores across the country have also pledged to pull all products made by Reckon Pinkieser Korea from their shelves or scale back their supplies. 
One major convenience store chain, GS25, said it will stop placing new orders from Oxy and return remaining stocks back to Oxy headquarters. CU also said that they have already stopped ordering products from the company since the end of last month and agreed to clear Oxy from their shelves until Friday. This comes on the tail of similar announcements made by major supermarket chains, including Lot Day Mart and online markets such as G Market, Auction, and Elevenst. Meanwhile, investigations into numerous deaths caused by the toxic humidifier sterilizers are widening. With the former CEO of the Korean branch of Oxy Record Bank Kizer Shin Hyun-woo summoned for a second time on Monday, Lee Min Young, Arirang News. A huge chunk of the corporate bond contracts held by Korea's top three shipbuilders is set to expire next year. The companies have been failing to turn a profit for years, instead staying afloat on constant bailouts. Our handout explains why the once dominant giants may be running out of time. Concerns are mounting that Korea's shipbuilders might go belly up next year. Financial sources say a significant amount of corporate bonds issued by the industry's top three companies, Hyundai Heavy Industries, Daewoo Shipbuilding and Marine Engineering, and Samsung Heavy Industries, are due to expire next year. The total amount stands at around 1.9 billion U.S. dollars. Daewoo has to pay back roughly 900 million dollars, while Samsung and Hyundai Heavy need to each return 510 million and 580 million dollars. Market watchers say it won't be an easy task as the companies have been suffering eye-watering losses due to low oil prices and slowing global demand. The companies won only five contracts in the first four months of the year, and Teu posted an operating loss in the first quarter. With growing fears that the shipbuilders could file for bankruptcy, some experts say it's time for the state to bail them out. The Bank of Korea could issue more currency and the government could inject money from its budget. A separate fund could also be set up so that the losses caused by corporate restructuring could be shared, instead of watching one company collapse. But critics argue that by printing more money to help the ailing shipbuilders, the central bank would negatively impact the livelihoods of the public in order to save companies that have been weighing down growth in Korea's corporate landscape for years. Han Dan, Arirang News. Seoul's Finance Minister Yu Il-ho says recent reports about a split in opinion between government institutions over capitalizing state-run banks to fund corporate restructuring are inaccurate. Speaking at a meeting with his officials Monday, the minister said, quite in contrary, the government and the central bank are looking to incorporate a mix of policies to put together the best plan possible. Now, he added that uh, expansion in capital would not be to support one company or industry, but rather to preemptively prepare for any financial instability that could emerge from the country's drive for corporate restructuring. Korea is currently looking to restructure some of its key industries, including shipping and shipbuilding, which have been struggling in recent years. Now, in Korean politics, the ruling Senate Party has decided to elect its new interim leadership in July. While opposition parties vowed to work with each other and with the ruling party in the 20th National Assembly to better serve the public, the new National Assembly kicks off at the end of this month. Our parliamentary correspondent Park ji reports. The ruling Senuri Party's newly elected lawmakers gathered at the National Assembly on Monday afternoon to discuss how to lead the Conservative Party out of its current crisis. When you elected me as a floor leader, you gave me the assignment of revamping the party. As we are facing a great deal of tasks, I hope you can freely give your opinions on new leadership and the party's future path. After more than four hours of closed-door discussions, the ruling party decided to hold its party convention in July to elect its interim leadership. The Senuri Party is still without a leader since the departure of former Chairman Kim Musong following the party's crushing loss in the April general election. The ruling party also decided to put off talks over what to do about former party lawmakers like Yu Seung-min, who left the party during the election but have applied to rejoin. 
They plan on picking up this issue after the 20th assembly begins at the end of this month. On the other side of the aisle, the main opposition Minju Party of Korea's new floor leader Woo Sang-ho met with Park Ji-won, his counterpart from the minor opposition People's Party. As the opposition parties will hold the majority in the 20th National Assembly, the two vow to respect and follow the will of the public, saying that they will try work with the ruling party to serve the public. We will try to build trust in our relations. I believe trust is the most important element among floor leaders. We knew each other when we were in the same party, so I believe we can work together in a way that will be fruitful for both the Minju Party and the People's Party. Let's not repeat the mistakes of the 19th Assembly. Let's make a productive and conscientious parliament. Let's put the economy first in order to make people's livelihoods better. The parties will also continue their discussions on leadership appointments for the 18 standing committees within the National Assembly. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Details of an anti-corruption bill that's currently being put together was announced today. Dubbed the Kim Young-nun Act after the lawmaker who proposed it or judge, the legislation is aimed at tackling a culture of indirect bribery among people of influence. Our Kwon Jung-ho has the specifics. A new law is currently being put together that aims to close loopholes that allow indirect bribing of public officials and people of influence. The Anti-Corruption Civil Rights Commission announced on Monday the specific limits on what gifts can be given to public officials, journalists and private school staff. For example, they can only be treated to meals worth at most around 25 US dollars. Any gifts they receive cannot be worth more than around 43 dollars. And cash gifts, usually given during family events such as weddings and funerals in Korea, are limited to a maximum of 86 dollars. Those found violating these limits are subject to up to three years in prison or a fine calculated at five times the worth of the money or gift that was received. This act will not apply to those public officials who receive money and gifts, but to those who give them as well. This culture of giving and taking is something that needs to be comprehensively considered. There are also limits on lecture fees for ministers, set at around $340 an hour. Journalists and school staff can receive up to $860 an hour. The bill passed the National Assembly in March 2015 and is scheduled to come into force in September, but it needs to be approved by the Constitutional Court first when it has been challenged. A petition has been filed by the Korean Bar Association arguing that the scope of this law is too wide and infringes on the Constitution, especially on the freedom of the press, as the law also specifically targets journalists. Civic infringements are also of a concern, as the law stipulates spouses are to report on any violation of the law. The top court has said it will deliver its verdict before the September deadline. Kwon Jang-ho, Arirang News. A list of Korean victims killed during Japan's Great Kanto earthquake in 1923 has been discovered, along with other official Japanese records. Historical documents from Korea and Japan show that some 6,000 Koreans were massacred during this destructive event. Oh Jung-hee has more. The list of Korean victims killed during the Great Kanto earthquake of 1923, including those murdered by Japanese soldiers, has been found among official Japanese records. The Japanese government office responsible for providing relief at the time had recorded more than 50,000 earthquake victims, and two Japanese researchers identified 71 Korean victims among them. This is the first time Japan's official data has been found to support the Koreans' death during the Great Kanto earthquake. So far, historical records from Korean newspaper Dongnip Shinmun, published in 1923 Shanghai, have shown more than 6,000 Koreans were massacred. Official records during Korean President Lee Seung Man's administration in 1952 also provide a list of 290 murder cases. The Japanese government has been trying to deny or downsize the issue of the Korean massacres during the Kanto earthquake, but this list of names found among official Japanese records is clear evidence. Some experts believe the massacre contributed to the deaths of more Koreans than the earthquake, as most Korean victims lived on the outskirts of Tokyo while the earthquake struck the center of the city. 
After the earthquake, a major civil unrest in Japanese society led to rumors that Koreans poisoned wells and planned a riot, which inflamed anti-Korean sentiment. The number of Koreans killed is expected to increase after a thorough review of Japan's list of earthquake victims is complete. Oh jung Arirang News. Now, shifting our focus, we celebrated Parents' Day here in Korea yesterday, but uh, special events to show love and appreciation to all mothers and fathers in this country continue today. Our Lee Yun Shin went out to capture those very special moments. To promote the recognition of parents beyond Parents' Day, the government continued celebrations on Monday with a series of special events. Mothers were the guests of honors at a ceremony hosted by the Cultural Ministry at the Seoul National Museum of Contemporary Art. Seven Korean artists, including a pianist, a painter, and a jazz singer, shared their stories of the sacrifices made by their mothers, which led to their success. The mothers were presented with a plaque of appreciation and a golden pin as a symbol of gratitude for raising and supporting the artists who contributed to society. These wonderful cultural contributors must have gone through many difficult days of hard work, and behind them was their mother's unconditional love. A similar heartwarming event was held at the Sejong Cultural Center for some 200 seniors who live alone. The Ministry of Health and Welfare and the Korea Association of Senior Welfare Centers teamed up for the event aimed at remembering all of the nation's elderly citizens. The number of elderly people who live by themselves is increasing. We don't want them to feel left out of Parents' Day festivities, so we prepared this event to help put a smile on their faces. Pinned with red carnations, the seniors enjoyed an afternoon of singing, dancing and relaxing massage therapy. I am deeply touched to be here. I have never received anything like this before. Today's events are a great reminder of the importance of family, along with the gratitude we owe to our parents. Also, they show us the need to take care for those who are not as privileged or without family. Yun Shin, Arirang News. A much wider range of perception on old Korea is now available to the public with some 300 books newly donated to the National Library of Korea. Now, this donation is especially significant as we get to see 19th century, early 20th century Korea through the eyes of women writers from the West. Lee Ji Won has more. From the spirit shrine on the summit, a lovely panorama unfolds itself, backed by a jagged mountain wall, attaining an altitude of over 6,000 feet in the loftiest pinnacle of the Kumgangsan, a fair land of promise, truly. This is an excerpt from the book Korea and Her Neighbors, describing the beautiful scenery of Mount Kumgang, written by British geographer Isabella Bird Bishop in 1897. It's one of the many books on Korea written by Westerners that are currently on display as part of a special exhibition at the National Library of Korea. Most of the books were written by women who visited the country from 1883 to the mid-1900s for missionary work, travel and other reasons. The books were donated by Professor Song Young dal who for the past 30 years has been collecting books and other documents on Korea by foreign authors. His collection includes photos, poems, novels, and records that show Westerners' perceptions of a country in transition at the end of the Joseon dynasty. The library held an opening on Monday to launch the exhibit and honor Professor Song and the writers. Professor Song himself could not attend as he is in the States, but his family and a grandson of Lilias Horton Underwood were there. Lilias Underwood was a royal advisor, teacher, and an author whose books about her life in Korea are included in the collection. Uh, I think it's natural when you live your whole adult life, or you learn to love the country and the people. Uh, it, it's all you know. All, but uh, what is impressive is that there's a recognition now uh, in Korea about the contribution of Western women, and I'm very, very pleased to see that. Just a fraction of Professor Song's books will be on display at the National Library of Korea's Exhibition Hall from Tuesday until June 5th. The rest of the collection is housed in a separate room where visitors can sign up to read them. Lee ji Arirang News.
polls have closed in the Philippines where voters cast ballots for president in a campaign that revealed wide distrust for the country's ruling elite. Bruce Harrison is live in the studio with me. And Bruce, uh, the man expected to win the election is Davao City Mayor Rodrigo Duterte. He's been compared to the U.S. Uh, Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump. Exactly, Kun Young. Well, right now, um, Duterte, according to unofficial vote tallies, is leading uh, following the closing of the polls. Uh, as being similar to Trump, um, he's positioned himself as an establishment outsider, and his campaign is focused on law and order. Also, like Mr. Trump, uh, Duterte's speeches have been peppered with foul language and other incendiary comments. Well, so Bruce, uh, what appears to be, uh, what, what does it appear Filipinos want in their next president? Well, what we've seen throughout the campaign is that a lot of people were upset for, uh, uh, with the ruling elite for not addressing things like inequality and um, poverty despite years of e economic growth during uh, that time. Uh, it may be Duterte's anti-establishment image that has carried him this far. He's also run a single-issue campaign promising to wipe out crime and drug abuse. Comments vowing to kill drug pushers and abusers have shocked his challengers, and he may be trying to ease concerns on election day. But I'd like to say that I'd like to, to reach my hand to my opponents. Uh, let us begin the healing now. Five candidates are on the ballot, and Senator Grace Poe is seen as the most likely contender to possibly defeat Duterte. A military official says Iran successfully tested a medium-range ballistic missile two weeks ago. The latest test comes as Tehran expands what it claims is solely a defensive arsenal. Tasneem News Agency quoted Brigadier General Ali Abdullahi as saying the missile has a range of 2,000 kilometers and 8 meters margin of error, meaning he says full accuracy. Iran's top leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, said in March that developing the missile program is key to the country's future. The United States and some European powers said the tests violate a U.N. resolution prohibiting Iran from firing missiles capable of carrying a nuclear warhead. Tehran claims the missile is capable of carrying only conventional warheads. Now, I'll shift our focus, Bruce. In some developing countries, uh, transporting crucial medical supplies uh, can be difficult and, and quite dangerous as well. And now we can use uh, drones to make that uh, life-saving supply drops. And it's being used in Rwanda this time. Yeah, that's right. Uh, a small startup called Zipline International Incorporated is going to use these drones to drop blood and vaccines uh, to transfusion centers in Rwanda. A U.S.-based UPS will provide the robotics company with $800,000 to make the drops at an estimated 20 times faster than by motorcycle transport. We do believe that supply chain, having an efficient and resilient supply chain saves lives. And so we've been actively engaged with organizations around the world bringing relief when supply chains are inefficient and broken. But you know... In the U.S., several companies, including UPS, are battling regulations to deliver packages by drone, and the delayed data collected from the flights in Rwanda is expected to help speed up the approval process. Now, Bruce, uh, this transportation of blood and vaccine, um, who are we expecting that those would help in Rwanda? Well, just one look based on where most of the government's blood goes, 50% to women who are he hemorrhaging after birth, another 30% to children suffering from malaria-induced anemia. So most likely those people. Right, so hopefully a successful endeavor for the companies involved as well as for the people in Rwanda. Thank you so much for the coverage. No problem. Well, the weather was generous over the long holiday weekend, especially yesterday was uh, quite sunny and warm. Perfect day for Parents Day, but the new week has kicked off with a cloudy start. Let's see what the weather has in store for us tomorrow. Jihan. Hello, Gonyang. Yes, it seemed like it was going to rain at any moment today, but we just had lots of clouds coverage throughout the day. But actually, rain is in the forecast for tomorrow. 
Right, so we should have our umbrellas ready when we head out tomorrow. Uh, we're getting frequent bouts of rain these days, but um, you know, May is a busy month here in Korea with a lot of holidays and meaningful days. Buddhist birthday is a holiday. Teacher day is coming up over the weekend. Now, what is the outlook? Well, uh, outlook is looking fine, but for tomorrow, rain is set to fall over southern coastal regions in Jeju starting very early in the morning before spreading to the nationwide by the noon. Then rain clouds will gradually move to the east by the evening. But precipitation will be light at 10 to 30 millimeters of rain for Jeju and southern coastal regions and 5 to 10 millimeters for the most parts of the country. So have a small umbrella handy before heading out to Tomorrow. Daily highs will be much cooler compared to today, but mild morning to start as the daily low here in Seoul and Jeju will start out at 15 degrees Celsius, while Daegu and Busan will kick off at 16 degrees Celsius. And as for the daily highs, Seoul will see a high of 19 degrees Celsius, while Daegu and Jeju will top out at 17. Now the outlook for the rest of the week is looking bright and warm even on the upcoming high. Holidays. That's Korea for you, and here's the international weather for viewers around the world. And that is our broadcast on this Monday night. I'm Moon Gun Young. Hope you enjoyed our show tonight. For our viewers in other parts of the world, have a good one. For those of you here in Korea and across Asia, a good night from Seoul.